You're listening to Let Me Tell You Why You're Wrong, all on Georgia Radio Network. Welcome to episode 125 of the Let Me Tell You Why You're Wrong podcast. I'm Dave Roberts. She is about to get her Western ass to listen to these words about her and her blog. Bias. Ratchet. Messy. Racist. Now I had to look up how to pronounce this one. Thought. <laughs> trash self. Generationally privileged. Cop sucker. I said cop sucker. Pushing copaganda. Fake newser. Not a bad bit. <laughs> the truth will come out. Jessica Salaji. Thanks. I need to know where you learned to pronounce thought. I Googled it. It came up on Urban Dictionary with a, uh, I mean, actually, if you Google it, it comes up and you hit the little thing next to it and it is thought. Like, I thought that was pronounced like way different. Uh, like I had to, I had to look up the definitions of these things. And me I'm still too. not, sh- I'm still not sure what Western ass means. Well, the ass wasn't in. She said she was saying like about to get Western means it's about to go down. Um, and so I guess she was saying like, you know, I like I looked up Western ass and it was an ass big enough to fill a uh, um, a saddle. And all I could think was like uh, um, Conway Twitty singing about tight fit and jeans. Like, I don't think that's a, I don't, that, that, that sounds like, like, like a compliment. Um, but yeah, I, I, I understood about 20% of that. Yeah. Well, you know, when they're trying to insult you and you shouldn't work so hard for an insult. They're go, trying way go too with hard. Your, go with your best one. I mean, you, you pick you, like like a like a, a golfer. Pick your club for for this lie. And go and swing it. But yeah, that whoever that was was working way too hard to try to insult you. And of course, you screen you screenshot it, bl- block out the uh, the name, and uh, and put it up. And you should have left the name. Well, the thing is, is like some if it's. I mean, obviously, if it's positive, no one's going to complain. But a a while back, I did screenshot it and post it and somebody reported it and Facebook took it down and put me in jail for 24 hours because I violated the community standards because one, you're not supposed to screenshot Facebook stuff and then use it to like bully so to speak but i i am of the i mean i understand that they're a private company and everything but i'm of the belief that if you put something out there in a public forum like you just have to deal with what happens when other people talk about it but yeah and when the salaji army goes after the person then you're a bully right for someone calling me a thought (laughs) which means for people who don't know what that means it means that hoe over there (laughs) Yes, I had to look it up, and <laughs> and, I, and I understand this is the whitest of the white guy ever. Like, I had to look it up and scroll down. It says, a woman of pers- promiscuous nature. I said, okay, that I understand. <laughs> yes. I mean, it doesn't hurt my feelings, obviously, because I shared it, but um, I don't think anything's hurt my feelings since the days of Chris Severe when I... Like the first time he commented and I thought it was like a real person. And then I realized it was a man who was married to his computer. But that was pretty much the turning point of my writing career and and negative feedback. But no, I have to respect your opinion to to worry about your insult. (laughs) Right. I mean. Someone calls me a name. I've been called worse by better. Yep. But it does. Yeah. It makes for entertainment. And, you know. And put some work into it. Well, don't. I mean, if you want to criticize my work or you think that I've done a bad job or I mean, I had somebody call me last week and said that, you know, along the lines of that, they thought they 
didn't do a good job of covering like a certain issue that was going on in the community. And and they offered their perspective on why. And I, I didn't necessarily agree, but I understood why they felt that way. And it was a respectful way to oppose. I mean, even if they had just sent an email or sent me a Facebook message or whatever, or told somebody or even said it publicly, it wouldn't have mattered because it was a legitimate piece of information that I'll use the next time I write about it, you know, but calling me a thought, like I just, I don't really know what you want me to do with that. <laughs> and let's just you say shocked. I was one. Let's say if I was like, what does that have to do with my writing? <laughs> I had never, I mean, that one I hadn't heard. Uh, it's about to get Western. I've never heard. <laughs> I mean, I, the, the most of the rest of it I, I I gathered, but it's like like they just went to a into a bag, a scrabble bag of insults, and just started pull, pulling one out after the other. Yeah. And we were talking before the show. I mean, it, you know, the the only thing, you know, racist is the, the word they throw, and they just want to shut down any debate. Like, oh, you can't respond. Nah. It's a mess. Everything's a mess. America twenty twenty. Lucky us. Yeah, and there's no there's no good comeback to it. I mean, it, because a Grand Wizard from the Ku Klux Klan would would say, "Well, I'm not a racist." Well, my thing is, 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 my thing is, is if you feel like somebody, I mean, I understand this won't work with everybody, and and it doesn't work in every context. But if if the goal is, as a lot of people say, to change the way that we have conversations. Why wouldn't you, instead of saying you're a racist or you're doing this or you're perpetuating that, why wouldn't you say, I don't really like how you said that? Or it, the reason that some people might not like why you said that is because X, Y, and Z in history and blah, 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 whether it's actually racist or not. I mean, there are certain things, obviously, that are very racially charged and ways to say them, but why not articulate it in a way that is less confrontational and more about understanding so that, I mean, being a racist is not a good thing. So, of course, people are going to take offense to you calling them that. And 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 all you've done is shut down the conversation so that they're not going to listen to you. And I'm not saying that that's right, but I think it would go a lot further if people said, well, this is why that phrase, not necessarily you are racist, but what you said is not received well. Well, and a story, not really a story, but a thing I shared on Facebook, I don't know, last week, about Daryl Davis. He's a, a jazz musician. He's a singer. And and I've heard this from multiple, from multiple sources, so I didn't really have to do too much background on it. <clears throat> uh, but he is credited with, with bringing people out of the Klan. And the way he did it was sitting down. And the story I heard, and this guy has been on Rogan and some some other stuff, is he was in a jazz club and he sat down with one one of the guys who was there and had a drink with him. They were talking about music and and things like that. And he says, you know, I've never I've never had a drink with a black guy before. And he goes, well, here's my number. Let's let's talk. Let's talk some more. And it turns out the guy was was in the KKK, and he. He changed the guy's heart because people fear what they don't know. Uh, and he's done this several times, but it wasn't his goal. That that he was genuinely interested in hearing the 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 point of view. It, it sparked his, his his curiosity. Well, how can you hate me? You don't know me. Uh, but by sitting down and listening and having a conversation, he cha- he changes people's hearts. And that's something you can't do just by throwing out, throwing out epitaphs. And what a remarkable thing to be able to do. I mean, that is, talk about somebody who's actually like changing the world. Yeah, one person at a time. And I'm not saying that's, that's his job. I'm not saying it's every person of color's job to go out and reach out. But having a conversation about, about it, and, and, and we've said before, when when Minneapolis happened, BLM had all of us, had all of us in the palm of their hand. We're like, you know what? You're right. There's something wrong here. You know what? You're right. We, we need to look at some, some reforms, look at, uh, look at better training requirements, 
Uh, we need to look at better, uh, uh, better policies uh, within within police departments. And then they ruined it. At this point, I'm over it because I, I, it's not. I, I hate to say I just don't give a damn, but it, it, it's really hard when the, the only narrative coming out is that I'm at fault. I'm like, ah, man, I, I fix air conditioners. I, I, I mean, that's, I don't, I mean, I, I don't have time to oppress an entire race of people. I'm busy fixing air conditioners. It's hot outside. Wait till fall. I'll press you in fall. I have more time. Well, and I think that the, I mean, it was short lived, but in even, even before George Floyd with the Ahmaud Arbery stuff, I mean, there were actual conversations that were being had about you know the system it, that's what i appreciated so much about the people speaking out about Ahmad Arbery was it was about the system and the corruption and the process and you know when the media isn't highlighting something how how stories and people truly get lost and it was a lot of dialogue and it was productive i honest i really do truly feel that it was productive and then it got, it's like we talked about with the riots and it got violent too. And on this show, we had two attorneys who could not be more politically opposed come to the, to the same conclusion that, and in the Arbor case, that th- those guys need to be in prison and they were wrong. And we all came to the same conclusion. Uh, we were all together on it. And I don't know, it be a conspiracy guy. The government, the government can't have you getting along. But we were, we were with you. uh, You know, they're like, Black Lives Matter. Like, well, yeah, I get it now. Uh, Black Lives Matter isn't a statement. It means Black Lives Matter too. And absolutely agree agree with the sentiment. I don't necessarily agree with the organization, but the sentiment, absolutely. You had us. You you, You had us in the mood to make meaningful change and you ruined it. And it's not necessarily BLM that ruined it, or it could have been an Antifa. When you start burning stuff and burning people's businesses and burning cop cars, uh, that's when that's when you lose the 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 majority, the 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 hardworking people that that you know were ready to stand elbow to elbow with you to make a change. You start burning stuff. I'm out. Well, you know what's what's also disappointing about it now is. Like we were talking about how everyone was united. Now you're saying that, I mean, so, and please make sure you correct me if I'm wrong, but you're saying that you don't necessarily support the cause, but you do the mission of equality. But we're all kind of taking a different approach now in terms of which organizations we're supporting or which people in particular we're supporting because, and which I think when you're disjointed and you have multiple groups not saying there's anything wrong with multiple groups, but when everyone has a different cause or thing that they're aligning with, it's not as effective. I mean, we're not on the same page because we're not it, all pulling in the same direction anymore. It's also unachievable goals. Stop killing us. Well, while that's that's an interesting moniker, it's not an achievable goal. Uh, limit the use of chokeholds. Okay. That's something that's something we we can talk about. I didn't say eliminate. Limit the use of chokeholds. Uh, uh, a duty to act. When you if you see an officer getting out of line, uh, everything in Minneapolis could have been could have been solved if anybody had grabbed dude by the by his collar and said, "Come on, man, come over here, cool off." It's over. You won. You know, as I've you know I've had conversations with a friend of mine. It's like, yeah, at, at some point, like you have bested me, sir. Let's go to jail. Uh, if they, if, if someone had just done that and say, Hey, you know, Hey, you if, so if you're making a duty to act, I think it's a great idea. Uh, but those are, those are conversations that we can have within reason and need to be had on the local level because the federal laws don't, don't filter down to local police departments. That stuff, those are conversations we need to have and they're not in the city to. of Atlanta. Oh, no, absolutely. Absolutely. That's, that's why we are a republic. And 
the, those are laws that, that you can go and talk to your state rep about, to, to your mayor about, to your police chief, to your sheriff, and, and ask your sheriff, what's your policy on chokeholds? What's your policy on duty to act? And have a, and have a conversation, because these people are accessible to us as citizens, where uh, the attorney general of the United States is not. He hasn't, you know, Chief Justice Roberts hasn't returned my email when I asked him to stop using my, my last name because he's an embarrassment. Well, at least, I at least I didn't call him a thought. True. But <laughs> to your point, to your point, though, the attorney general, I mean, he was kind of put in his position because of his pol- position on policies that are in line with the president. At the local level, sure, we still are have a representative type government, but there's wriggle room for public feedback and public pressure as there should be. I mean, the government closest to the people is supposed to be responsive to the people, but there's actually wiggle room for that to occur. Whereas I don't expect William Barr to give a rats behind what I think. Right. And again, he doesn't have, you know, his authority is, is the Department of Justice, is, you know, the federal level. Uh, wh- when you go and you talk to your sheriff, who is accountable to the people, and, and you can ask him stuff. And, and, and I guarantee if I go and ask Gary Gullish today, you know, what's the policy on chokeholds, he'll tell me, is, you know, you, you've got to get an upper hand, but one, once you have cuffs on somebody, it stops. It's over. So that, I mean, and and I I have not spoken with him about it, but I, I I'm sure with some more some more country uh, 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 sayings in it. But yeah, I, there wasn't a single person that I knew that that said what what happened in Minneapolis was right. That George Floyd just, you know, needed a knee on his neck for nine minutes. There's nobody that said that, and if they did, we all would have turned against him. So I don't know. This wasn't even on the outline. We just kind of got off, got off on a on a tangent on it. But it, it is it is what's on t- on top of our minds right now because you can't turn the d- damn TV on without without seeing with without seeing it. And thanks to COVID, there's no new programming, so you can watch reruns of Family Feud or reruns of Jeopardy, or uh, uh, you turn the news on and the news is just a rinse and repeat of of uh, of what's going on. Speaking of what's going on, DeKalb County activist, my least favorite word, has filed a lawsuit and federal complaint against the Metropolitan Atlanta Rapid Transit Authority, as we call MARTA, after agencies stopped 70 bus routes amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Have you heard any fodder about this? I mean, I know that we're going to be referencing an article, a couple articles that were put out about this, but did, did you hear about this? No, no, no okay. not till you told me to read it. <laughs> okay, so the 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 man who is suing, he's he's an activist. He said he's chairman of the Concerned Citizens for Effective Government. And I actually just actually like stumbled upon it on Twitter. I, I don't know that I would have otherwise um cuz this was the article that we were talking about was published on the Center Square, which is not a a publication that I frequently read, but he's suing the board of directors, the CEO and the general manager. Jeffrey Parker, and he's, I, I think he's suing, it's, an, it's a federal lawsuit, but I think he, um, well, um, excuse me, he filed a federal complaint because of the 1965 Civil Rights Act, and then he has the lawsuit that is in Fulton Superior Court, because that's where MARTA is, but His argument is that riders don't have alternatives for transportation and they don't make enough to afford a car or take Uber all the time or call a taxi. And the board, his claim is that the board is either not recognizing their role to quote represent people across districts or they're just blatantly ignoring their duty. I'm inclined to think that like California and stuff where they're in shelter at home and stuff that they're not. There, and in Chicago, all, where they've limited people from out of state, I can't imagine that they're operating as normal. 
there's there's so many layers to it. One, uh, I totally agree uh, with 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 the idea. Even if you're if you're an essential worker, how do you get to work? If this is how you got to work, and this is how uh, uh, it has been sold to you as a way to get to work, that you know, travel smarter with Marta. Uh, that this is the this is the way you, you move around Metro Atlanta. So if you're if you work work at Grady and you're essential, how do you get there? Uh, secondly, being there aren't grocery stores in every neighborhood. Uh, so how do you how do you get to the grocery store? I mean, are, are you stuck going to the to, to the corner market to to get groceries, which is more expensive and typically le- uh, less quality food? Than if you go go to a Publix, but you know the other side of the argument is how many how many bus drivers are you supposed to if you're in if you truly believe you're in a pandemic? I mean, first of all, the bus is the last place I want to be anyway because it's disgusting. Uh, but what about that driver? And how, how many drivers didn't show up? How, did they did they have to reduce routes because they just didn't have the manpower to to operate the bus? Well, that was one of my first questions, coupled with how about the fact that Marta very much, like, let's say that for for round numbers that they had 200 bus drivers for 100 routes, right? Well, are you, and then some are fired, some are sick, some might be older, some may be compromised, some, you, you don't know, but you can't, if you're on a limited staff already, I don't think you're going to staff everyone all of the time because then you're in even worse situation because if someone one of those limited staff gets sick or leaves or whatever the case may be or is reprimanded for some unrelated reason then you're even in a worse situation you can't staff everyone you have all the time well it'll be interesting to see how they decided what routes to to uh limit if it was uh if it was that this route generates more money because you have more fair paying people than you do uh, subsidized riders. Uh, how they decided what routes they were going to go into limit and the the uh, the the logistics of you only have you don't have enough drivers. Uh, plus, you've got a you've got. When you have to sterilize the buses in between, that's that's increased downtime uh, for, for the for the actual bus. So there are a lot of things go into it. Well, no, I was just going to say in in this Central Square article, who referenced plans by Marta itself, but also spoke to the man who's suing. It said that before the outbreak, there were 101 routes served serving 500,000 people. And then with bus ridership down by 40%, Parker announced a plan April 16th to run 41 bus routes and double buses on 34 of the busiest routes beginning April 20th. I mean, I, again, I still don't know what that means with regard to your specific question, but it sounds, and, and one of the concerns is that there has to be a public hearing before they change the schedules or fares. And while I am a huge proponent of following the laws and doing what you're supposed to do. The legislature approved a measure that said you can have public hearings by teleconference and tele video, all that stuff. They approved that this session prior. And I don't, it hasn't been signed into law yet, but prior to that, you could only have public hearings in person and pretty much everything has public hearings have been suspended, which is why the legislature made that move. And so all I'm saying is that, there was not an environment for a public hearing unless maybe they had it like, I don't know, Phillips Arena or State Farm Arena so that you could social distance and do all that kind of stuff. So I'm not making excuses, but every place I know had to make decisions outside of the parameters because we were in a pandemic. Yeah, we're having a hard time getting grand juries together. Uh, look, you have to be nimble enough to react to emergency situations. And we were told this was an emergency. This this is no different than if the streets of Atlanta were flooded. You don't have a meeting to discuss the bus can't get down a flooded street. There, there are provisions in place for 
uh, emergency actions. Now, do I think the emergency is probably passed and they could certainly uh, either have a have a hearing or get uh, get back to the normal routes now? I, th- I think they should. Uh, I mean, look, I, in an ideal world, I, you know, I'm a, you know, Republican. I wouldn't have Mart at all. It, or, and if it did, it would be a for profit uh, transit company and they would actually turn a profit instead of being subsidized by the taxpayers. Don't you agree, though, that organization funded by tax dollars, that they have a duty to adjust for the fact that the ridership was down 40 percent? Sure. <clears throat> you know, the, the, other, the alternative is a story coming out in the AJC of MARTA running empty buses. Right. <clears throat> Which I'm sure they still are at times, but that's not their fault. I mean... So they were in a no-win situation with this. And if they did keep running and they contact Trace back to a MARTA bus, uh, they're, they're going to lose their minds about that. There, there, there's, there's no win being on that commission right now. And there's a lot of, a lot of no wins with the, the entire COVID thing. I do not think it was malicious. I, don't, I mean, I have a hard time believing that they're sitting in an office somewhere some smoke filled back room going, hey, screw those folks. Sure. I, th- I think it's, well, it was more of a they panic. They keep their jobs. Well, yeah. it was more of a panic. What do we do? We're down 50% of our bus drivers. What do we do? What can we do to, to, to stay operational and service the routes that have the most traffic? What do we do? And you, you get a map of Atlanta out and you start. You start going through it and say, what routes can we consolidate? What routes uh, do we have to eliminate altogether because the ridership's all the way down? Well, and it kind of prompted a thought in my mind, too, just about how the legislature passed the, the bill about liability and, and Governor Kemp, I feel sure, is going to sign it into law. But just it doesn't protect from these types of things because that's liability. This is just complications and misdoings. and. The number of lawsuits and the amount of money that local, state, federal governments and their insurance companies are going to be paying out because of decisions they made and the discretion they used in really otherwise super difficult times. I mean, even I can concede that and I'm super cynical about government. Um, yeah. There's no telling how many hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars is going to be paid out because people aren't just asking for injunctions. They're saying they've been wronged, you know. Right. They're not just saying, can you make this right? And that's not going to help a not non profitable organization. At all. So Marta was the news a lot last week because they also plan to defy Keisha Lance Bottoms mandatory mask order. As if they're not. This came out the same day. Um, I think she signed her order like late Wednesday night. And this came out on Thursday just ahead of the news about the lawsuit. So I'm sure that old Jeffrey Parker, the CEO is like, great. Um, But I thought his reason was interesting. He said he doesn't want to provoke confrontations between employees and passengers over an issue that has become highly politicized. I think that's a fair, a fair assessment. No, I think it's absolutely fair and reasonable is do you want the bus driver kicking somebody off a route when they say, uh, I have a medical reason for not wearing it, I have uh, a religious reason for not wearing it, or, uh, you know, just up yours? Uh, That bus driver isn't paid to be uh, Mayor Bottoms' uh, police force or, or the mask police. That person is paid to drive the bus. And it... Would do, yeah. I, I don't. I don't see foresee anything good happening from that. Plus, you're going to get a bunch of yahoos like me that'll 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 hop on there just to get thrown off. And it says, um, his quote, Parker's quote was, "I'm very hesitant to put our frontline employees, particularly bus operators, in a clear conflict with people for reasons that perplex me. We're so polarized about this issue of having to wear masks." Um, and one of one board member, Dr. Roderick Edmond, who is a doctor, said that 
the confrontations would be worth the lives saved by requiring all passengers to wear masks. It's clearly that it's clear this is a deadly virus. If they don't wear a mask, they should not be allowed to ride. Show me the data on that one. Well, and but not only that, but pump the brakes because you're sitting here saying that they should not be allowed to ride. I mean, where's your funding come from? And here's the other thing. I see a lot of mask on chin. Yes. Uh, a lot of noses are slipped out of their bra. Uh, and of course, there's a... Uh, of course. But, you know, you go to the grocery store where they're mandated to wear these masks, and you, and you see the the noses are out. Sometimes it's all the way down to the chin. It's just the, these folks don't, you know, have a hard time wearing it, especially the cloth masks, the... That are that are sewn at home and there are two or three layers and people are having a hard time breathing through them. Uh, I was talking. Oh, I was talking to uh, one of the folks at at my gun club, and I, she's a, a recent. I think it was the recent grandmother was talking about. Apparently, when her daughter was was in the hospital giving birth, they made her wear a mask in the delivery room, and you know, of course, the the you know stereotypical birth. She keeps trying to pull the mask down so she can breathe, you know, she, you know, and, and they keep pulling the mask up and chastising her. That makes me claustrophobic thinking about, I mean, I've never given birth, but the idea of that makes me. Yeah, you're, you're up in the stirrups. You got a whole room of people and lights around you. You're, uh, you're, I, th- I think the husband was allowed in the room. I think the husband is allowed in the room for, for, for birth. Uh, but, and, and you can't go anywhere and they keep pulling, they keep pulling this thing over your, over your nose and mouth. I mean, at, at least run a, uh, an O2, uh, you know, the, the booger dryer under it. So, I mean, you, you feel like you're getting, getting some oxygen, but that's, that's where we are. Is it, it is it, it is highly politicized. Uh, everybody just can't worry about themselves apparently. By the way, Jessica, these are our opinions and not necessarily those of All in Georgia and certainly not those of any All in Georgia reporter not offering commentary on the show, which I think is an important point to hit, especially how we started the show. <laughs> well, let's get to the mess of Marjorie Taylor Greene. This is your congressional district. This is my congressional district. And God, it's a mess. Uh, this is Tom Graves' seat. Um, she owns, or... No, Dave, it's the people's seat. It is the people's seat. Uh, she owns, Taylor, I think it's Taylor Construction. They're a siting contractor. They do, like, multifamily and things like that. Uh, she was running for Congress in the 6th District and then uh, jumped over to the 14th when Tom announced he would not be uh, running for re-election. She captured more than 40% of the vote in a nine-person primary. Which is impressive. It is. She came hard and she came strong when she announced. Now, look. She also came from another congressional district she, that she didn't live in. She did. I, I, I don't know what the motivation. I mean, I don't. Other than she didn't want to run against Karen Handel and Lucy McBath. Um, which that district is more purple. Um, and Karen Handel is not my favorite person. Uh, but she fits the district. She does. She fits the district fine. I just, I'm just, just tired of seeing her name. That, that there's, a, there's a fair amount of candidate fatigue with Karen Handel. Uh, but yeah, Lucy McBath, who yeah, oddly enough would be, uh, you know, lives in Tennessee. So anyway, she jumped over, over here to the 14th. Uh, her sign started coming up in a big way. I mean, she, she spent some money. And she and she paid for she p- went to the Ra- Raffensperger playbook with paying people on on high traffic areas to put her signs out. Is my understanding. She- I know Raffensperger did. Oh, well, I, I do, too. I just I don't go up to the four. I'm not up in that district, so I didn't know. All I know is that the Twitter hashtags are littered with her posting signs and just saying Chattooga County, Catoosa County, Paulding County. And I'm like, okay, we get it. You have signs up. Like every fourth post on Georgia poll is hers. Yeah. 
and uh and, and had you been up in the 14th and not at least called i'd be i'd be i'd be a little hurt connie would be really hurt <laughs> happy anniversary connie <laughs> <laughs> ah man and i have i have taken the time to to meet with her um i went to one of the campaign events and, and i've spoken about it on the show before she's playing she's playing the trump game i mean her her campaign is aimed towards the lowest common denominator uh the people i met at her at her thing i just roll my eyes out of my head but then i talked to her campaign manager really you know thoughtful guy i spoke with her husband really husband super super nice guy i mean i i, I like him and then talked to her and she is when not on she is a totally reasonable person. She's uh, completely lovely. But she also does stuff like take her Mercedes back, hop in her pickup truck, and go to a funeral with a bunch of followers wearing Marjorie Green signs. Oh, that was awful. Uh, she also does stuff like yell at kids or go to Washington to, to sit outside Pelosi's door as a political stunt. Uh, she, her campaign is so insulting to me that I can't I, I can't see myself voting for. Her. And like I said, if I like Marge. And you know, if if you take all the other stuff away and you sit down and talk to her, she's completely reasonable. And we we were talking before the show. Some of her stances are great. She's outstanding on the Second Amendment. And she definitely understands what the she's a good Tenth Amendment person. She knows what is the role of the federal government and what is the role of the states. And we were talking about how that can easily be a cop-out and how a lot of times when someone gives that answer, there should be follow-up questions. And I totally agree. But I absolutely respect when a candidate will say, that's not the federal government's position. I still want to know what they think about it but because the federal government is handling it. But she's very good about saying that the Congress has no place handling that. Absolutely. Uh... But some of the some of the crap that she has that that she's throwing, she's throwing, she's trying to be Trump. And it doesn't work for anybody but Trump. I I don't I don't I don't like it. I don't I don't like uh, Twitter diplomacy. I, I don't I, I. I don't know how we got from Lincoln Douglas to 122 characters. Uh, I don't think people have the bandwidth to listen to an actual debate anymore. We don't even have debates anymore. We have forums where questions are answered. We don't have debates anymore. We don't have back and forth and unpack complex issues anymore. One, because the candidates are too afraid to do that in front of anybody. And the other is that the American public doesn't have the bandwidth to actually listen and, while people unpack uh, complex issues. Uh, but she said she would feel proud to see a Confederate monument if she were black because it would symbolize the progress since the Civil War. So I agree that it shows prog. I mean, history shows progress by default. Um, not. Uh, I don't know when she said that comment. Either I said I read that a lot of these that were taken by Politico and the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times were between 2017 and and like January 2019. And so I don't know when she said it, but I don't think that would ever be a popular way to say it. No, it's a, it's an incredibly obtuse way of saying it. And the fact that she said it before she was a political candidate doesn't absolve her of it because that's what she said when she wasn't trying to win office. So I, other than maturing, and obviously I would never hold a, a, a middle-aged candidate responsible for something he or she said when they were 18. Uh, I think that's a ridiculous standard. Uh, and I really, uh, George W. Bush had the best policy on it, which is I will talk about nothing that happened before the age of 30. And he was incredibly candid about that in, in his autobiography about, you know, he was, he was a drinker. He wasn't, he wasn't, I mean, he was a good guy and a good husband. It just, he, he was, he was kind of a mess. Uh, but he he says I'm not going to talk about anything about the age uh, before the age of thirty, and that's I think that's totally appropriate. 
as especially for men, we 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 take some while to a while to season. Well, and I just I hate. I mean, aside from Marjorie Taylor Greene, I hate that we have become a society that is unaccepting of personal growth. <laughs> I mean, I am not the same person I was five years ago and ten years ago. My goodness, I mean. Well, yeah, you're you're growth. like eighteen ten years ago. Thank you, Dave. And here's the thing: is I don't. If you unpack the issue of being proud to see a Confederate mo- monument if she were black, when you unpack that and you say, uh, and maybe she's just not very bright, and that's quite possible. She could just not be very bright. Is say, we need to celebrate the, the constant progress this country's made towards equality. We started off with an ideal that wasn't in practice and have endeavored for the last 244 years to achieving the the ideals that were written in the, in our constitution, and, and and we have, and we were talking off offline within one person's lifetime, and I don't think it's mine. I think it's a little older than I am, but it was illegal to have an interracial marriage. You had to leave the country. You had to, uh, I think Massachusetts was one of the last ones to to allow it, uh, if I recall correctly. But you, it was illegal to uh, to have an interracial marriage. And it wasn't that long ago. It's within within one person's lifetime. And to say, you know, within one person's lifetime, we went from having separate water fountains to having all water fountains covered in plastic because we're scared of COVID, uh, and and separate entrances to uh, to a lunch counter and segregated buses. And to think that within one person's lifetime, we we have we have moved so far. And, and so if you will turn and look back on history and see where we've come in that, in that progress, it, we, that should be celebrated. And, and, and you know, if, I think her, her words are, are obtuse, but that sentiment is, is, is appreciated. Uh, black people are held slaves to the Democratic Party. I have heard that term used, and I rarely heard it used by white people. It's just it's just not a good optic. Uh, this this goes to Dave, the the uh, political observer. Is there a better ways to say that? And I and I this is this is I don't know, Jessica. It's got to be. It's got to be just the Trump effect. Say, say the, say it the most outrageous way, so it gets the most attention. Sure, but I mean, I agree with the sentiment that the Democratic Party seeks, and I don't think it's just any particular race or it's socioeconomic that Democrats need their voters to remain dependent for their policies to make sense. So, of course, they're going to perpetuate dependency because they're promoting dependency, whether that's, you know, and, and you could say the same. The thing is, you could say the same thing about corporate welfare on the Republican side. So, oh, sure. And, and the and the stimulus packages and everything else and buying votes. Uh, the the I think you hit the nail on the head when we talk about it all the time is socioeconomic. Status, I think, is so much more damning than than race. Uh, a you know scuzzy white dude will get treated the same as a uh, 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 you know anybody else in his socioeconomic st- uh, status, to, regardless of race. Uh, and somebody who who comes off the way I do. Uh, you know, I get pulled over and it's yes, sir. No, sir. And, you know, if I, if someone says, Mr. Roberts, you're under arrest with, well, okay, can I make a phone call? You know, that guy's going to be treated with respect, you know, cause I have a different level of education, socioeconomic status than someone who's going to be, you know, F the police. Yeah. Um, the next one probably was a little more inflammatory and and I think is the one one of two that drew the negative feedback from so uh, many Republicans. At the 2018 midterm elections, 
in which the first two Muslim women were elected to the House were part of an Islamic invasion of our government. Yeah, her quote was the in, in Islamic invasion of our government, which, I mean, this is America. <laughs> we encourage people of all walks of life to run for office so that they are represented. Absolutely. And look, I don't like to leave. I mean, I, but not because she's Muslim. No, I don't like her because of her policies uh, and, and, and her quotes and, and everything else. I don't dislike AOC because she's of Hispanic descent. Uh, I actually like her for, for the comedy. I mean, it, she's worth having up there just to make fun of. Um, but this is fear mongering. Uh, this again, she's trying to out Trump Trump. And I think Donald would would read this and go, whoo, you stepped on the third rail there, didn't you? Well, and it's just not you should I don't I'm a believer that you should never bring someone's faith into. Question in any capacity, because it's a very personal thing, just like it's not my place to question whether or not someone is a good enough Christian or, you know. There's don't identify people like this uh, from the abstract. If you want to say that our country is being, you know, if we're facing a battle for policies that are not healthy for our republic, you're going to have. I understand that's not going to get the media attention, but that's pretty dang accurate, and it has nothing to do with the race of or faith or anything or the gender of people getting elected. But in the abstract, shouldn't we celebrate uh, someone of the Muslim faith breaking? the typical gender roles of that faith and being in charge. Oh, you mean like saying symbolizing the progress that we've made? Exactly. Then we have the George Soros, a billionaire philanthropist who was born into a Jewish family in Hungary during the Nazi occupation was a quote, Nazi himself trying to continue what was not finished. Yeah. Mm. Again, not an, a territory she should have entered into. Yeah, the Republican Jewish Coalition uh, told Jewish Insider this week that it would not support Green if she were if she won the runoff, but would not oppose her either. Which I think is a pretty um, generous thing to say when she. Um, uh, you know, mm. I have heard that stuff about uh, Soros before, and I'm not a fan of George Soros by any stretch of the imagination. I, I, I think he's as close to a true evil man as possible. But the accusation that he was a Nazi, do the math. I mean, he, he was a child during the occupation. And I believe the story is they, he was, uh, uh, they hid his heritage from the Nazis so he could survive. Uh, I mean, it's not, again, you using somebody's faith against him. Ah, it's, it's silly. Yeah, just talk about his policies if you don't like his policies or his influence. I mean, start there and stay there. Get back in your box. Exactly. And we got the QAnon stuff. Uh, and QAnon is a conspiracy theory that there is a global, uh, a global child abuse network running through Hollywood of pedophiles uh, that is... Uh, it's 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 out there. Uh, but she doesn't back off of it. She doubles down. And Jody Heiss rescinded his endorsement. And that's pretty big. I mean, when. In Georgia, because he's from Georgia. Right, and, when, and when you have uh, people taking back their endorsements and and there's been a bunch of posts from Cowan, who who is her opponent in the runoff of taking her signs down in people's yards and putting his signs up after he talks to them. Uh, speaking of... That happens whether you're controversial or not, though. I mean, it's the, people... It's the documenting of it. That's, that's, yeah. that's annoying. So we have so, Cowan and Green going at each other about using foreign labor. Foreign. Lord have mercy. So John Cowan is a neurosurgeon, a backstabber, uh, <laughs> that ha developed uh, toys that support 
neurological growth in children. And apparently, he had the toys put together in China, like everything is put together in China. Uh, if you don't want that toy to cost $500, I mean, that's, that's where stuff is made. Uh, then he fires at Green for not using uh, E-Verify for their subcontractors and employees uh, up until 2010. Go to a construct. Go to a construction site. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not defend defending her specifically, but, no, go, but go to any construction site. It's, a, it's like a farmer. I mean, some of them are through the uh, H2A program. Some of them are not. They do what they have to do. I, I'm not. Again, I'm not defending it either. But like you said, I mean, it, in a business environment, you have to remain competitive. And both of them did what what is, has been accepted practice uh, to compete in, in a in a in the market. So if if Taylor Construction was you know five dollars a linear foot higher on siding than somebody else, but they're like, oh, but the, the bottom they don't care, they'd be out of business. Same thing with with Cowan is if he says, well, these toys are made in America, and that's why they cost, you know, 200 times what it would if, if we had it from China. You know, it just it wouldn't matter. The toys wouldn't sell. You can't bring them to market like that. But they're both disingenuous by, by lobbing a taxi to each other about it. This is going to sound terrible, but I am less concerned about what they're doing with their business because I assume that almost everyone who is elected to Congress is doing something shady with their business or has done or has, I mean, whatever. Like, I want to know, I want somebody who is not going to screw me when they make votes. I, and, I don't care about this. As, and and as show much. up for votes. Well, that would be helpful, Vernon. Yeah, he pops up on my Facebook all the time. And I if you want to say, well, just, you know, sure. it'd be nice if someone showed up for votes, huh? So anyway, uh, Green is <laughs> suing Cowan's campaign over... The accusations. Uh, it's we're going long. So I don't want uh, uh, too long to get into a lawsuit, and no one wants to listen to two lay people talk about uh, talk about a lawsuit and and read the lawsuit page by page. Yeah, yeah, no, we won't do that to you. But I don't, I don't. My only closing thought, because I don't want to, I don't want to harp on it either. Is you know, I've been super vocal about my opinion on masks, like. I, I, I choose when I can to wear a mask when I go in somewhere um, that I can't socially distance, but I am adamantly opposed to mandated masks. And we've seen over the last week and a half pretty much that cities are defying Kemp's order and all Kemp is doing is saying that it's unenforceable. And I am ready for him, like he did with the National Guard in Atlanta, I'm ready for him to either take it out of his order and let the cities run wild or to freaking stand up and say in court or may and call their bluff and that they that he doesn't have the authority they say he doesn't have fight it out in court stand up for the people or take it out of your order and stop pretending like you care Hasht- what local governments do to people hashtag one term he's he's hurting himself with this i think it's one of the most damaging things he did because he professed that he was doing it to rein in the local governments. And he was right to do it when he did, because we saw, we talked on the show about how out of control they were. But it, when it matters, when they're actually doing something, when they're calling his bluff, he needs, he's, he's got to stop. Yep. And I, every time I see the, the, the order from, from mayor of Atlanta, I just put, she doesn't have the authority. My closing thought is it is a tax week. It is organized theft week, so make sure you got your 401k contributions in and uh, go go and pay our our uh, government masters. Uh, if you like what you heard, be sure to like us and share us on social media. So for Jessica Salaji, for Eric Cumby, for Tilly the cat who made her appearance again, and that will come up in the audio. I have Dave Roberts. Have a great week. 